Okay, thanks comrades. Um, I think the period of the uh, 70s and the 80s uh, marks a transition, if you like, from um, open confrontation with the capitalist state on the question of racism to some sort of accommodation or compromise of that same system. Thank you, Microsoft. Um, so, looking at, looking at the, uh, the question from uh, you know, where black people are at in Britain in the 70s and 80s, I think our experience was shaped by the needs of capital. Um, so, immigration into Britain was to fit a need of capital. There was a labour shortage in Britain, there were jobs to be done and so on. Um, and also, of course, there was a struggle uh, against capitalism and against the racism that capitalism breeds. Uh, those two things, I think, dominated uh, uh, the experience of black and Asian people that uh, came to this country in large numbers uh, after the war. Um, and it's worth just talking about immigration because you can sometimes perhaps have the idea that uh, the British state is a benevolent structure and that they wanted to be nice to all the immigrants. But I think we should stay, say things as they were and as they are, in fact. But the establishment, the ruling class in this country always saw immigration as a problem, not as an opportunity to uh, enrich the human race, blah, 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 and stuff you sometimes hear them say. Uh, they saw it as a problem, um, but they had to get this labour into the country, but it was an alien culture these people represented inside the host community, and it would always be a problem. It would be a problem how to integrate these people properly, and so on. And in fact, many of them didn't actually want to integrate any of them, wanted to just use the labour and hopefully uh, get them to go back to where they came from. And to be honest, actually, that was the idea in the heads of um, many West Indian people that came to this country because it's too damn cold. It was to get the money in and go back to Jamaica, Barbados, wherever else uh, you'd, you'd come from. Obviously, that dream never happened. Lots of people stayed. Um, and I think it's also the 70s and 80s marked a break generationally, if you like. Can't overstate it because it wasn't the case that black people didn't, um, black old people didn't oppose racism. Of course, they did. Uh, but there might have been a, a little bit more reticence, you might say, for the people that initially came over on the wind rush. Um, or trying to find their way in a, in a new country and so on. Compared to those like myself, others here that were born in this country and um, didn't know anything else. I wasn't, I wasn't that happy to call myself British, actually. <laughs> I preferred to call myself a, a, a black person. That was, that was it. Um, but um, nevertheless, if they uh, wanted to kick us out of Britain, we're happy to restate the fact that no, we're born here, we're here to stay, here to fight, which is one of the slogans that could be heard in the 70s very often. Um, and I think the struggles that black and Asian people got involved in uh, in the 70s and 80s, to some extent, were inspired by the mass movement in the 1960s of African Americans, um, sometimes called the, uh, the, the, the second um, uh, American revolution, if you like, because the first one wasn't completed because they had a revolution for bourgeois freedom, but they forgot to tell the African people about it in America, who were still obviously slaves. So it wasn't quite a thoroughgoing bourgeois revolution, if that's meant to mean democracy for everyone and so on. It was very far from it. Um, so that had to be dealt with. We had the massive civil rights movement that we can't go into now, but we know that it grew over into a black power movement and into an assault, an attempt to come to terms with the capitalist state, how to break it, how to actually get rid of racism and build a different kind of society. At this top were people like the, around the Black Panther Party who espoused those sorts of politics and came and, and, and lent on Marxism to some extent as well as other ideas in black nationalism and so on. Um, that inspired people in Britain, there's no doubt about it, but I think it would be a mistake to say that uh, the US uh, template could just be dropped on top of Britain and could be made useful. There were problems with it in the United States, so it's hopefully we can go into in debate and so on anyway, but in Britain there are even more problems uh, with, that, um, with that approach. Um, first of all, you weren't talking about a homogenous, all the same, black community, I just use black to mean black and Asian, as we used to in the 70s. Um, I might change it slightly sometime, at some points, but the black community was not homogenous. Um, so you had people from the uh, Afro-Caribbean tradition, people from the Indian subcontinent, uh, from Bengal, from Pakistan, what became Pakistan, what became, uh, became India. So there was that divide. I'm not saying it was a divide that meant people were fighting each other, but there was a divide of different uh, traditions, different cultures were coming um, from different places. Um, some from the countryside, in, uh, in the subcontinent uh, of India. Um, to some extent, some from the countryside in places like Jamaica as well, but mostly from cities in places like Jamaica. Um, so different experiences. Um, and it uh, also worked out in terms of what were the main concerns of the different communities. Um, so although it's crossed over, I'm not saying there's a war between the two, very much the case that inside the Asian community, there was a lot more concern around the question of uh, immigration controls and getting people into the country um, as opposed to inside the African Caribbean community, 
there were those, those issues as well, but the more dominant issues were ones of police racism um, and institutional racism in terms of the education system. Um, and you can see how that played out in the 70s and 80s, as we, as we shall see. Um, and also, in terms of the difference between the United States and Amer America, I'm going to say it's not homogenous, that was true, but it was also the true in terms of uh, the demographics of the situation that was totally different. In the USA, you have ghettos where just black people live, aren't they? and there's no one else, maybe, might like one or two, but it's not, not statistically significant numbers of anyone else. So, um, when, you, when the civil rights movement became the black power movement in the urban centres, uh, where black people were concentrated in the highest, uh, highest numbers, in places like Harlem, in places like Watts and so on, these are black ghettos. So, actually, it's quite a sensible idea to, to talk about, you know, uh, um, uh, black self-defence. You are talking about black people defending themselves. That seems to be the co an obvious common sense, because there weren't any white people around to help. You know, it was you against the white cops. Uh, it's fairly obvious. Um, that wasn't the case in Britain, though. I know parliamentary constituencies or whatever, where you have 100% black populations. In fact, there are very few where you have a majority non-white population. Well, I think Leicester has one. Um, so that was different also. Um, so as far as the British state was concerned then, dealing with black people um, was about controlling them, how to control them. Um, and it wasn't very long before the labour shortage ran into the uh, decline of the British Empire and the British economy, which meant there was no longer such a labour shortage and these people didn't need to be coming here in such numbers. Um, people like Enoch Powell, the Arch Tory, uh, started up a campaign against uh, mass immigration that was damaging the nation, um, mass immigration into this, into this country. Um, and at this point, you know, immigration is something that was cross-party. Um, unfortunately, although there, there are lots of individual socialists in the Labour Party um, that loved immigrants or you know, tried to ameliorate their position and to work with them and to better the position of all and the rest of it, very unfortunately, that wasn't the position of Labour Labour governments that actually pandered to and bent over backwards to um, look after the, the hurt feelings of the racists that didn't want to walk down the road with black people or take money out of their hands on the 38 bus if it was a black conductor, as my dad was uh, once upon a time. Um, you know, so it was, it was all of that. Um, and so you get a whole number of uh, immigration scares that are whipped up both by the politicians, people like Enoch Powell and, uh, and the mass media. Um, and you often hear the Labour Party say that, you know, we have to be uh, very considered, that's why we have a thing called Parliament, where we debate things out and have big discussions about it and stuff, and we take it to the Lords, it comes back, does this, da, 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 and eventually you get a bit of policy. Well, that's not how they did it on immigration. In a day and a night, they pushed through a law on immigration, um, which uh, basically barred people coming into this country from uh, the, uh, um, East, East Africa. Um, I won't go into details of East Africa, but suffice to say, there was some communalism that started, so some of the African leaders, Idi Amin, for example, tried to play a game of divide and rule and tried to blame the problems of post-colonial uh, uh, Uganda, for example, or Malawi and, other, and Kenya, in this case, in 68. Um, blame it on the uh, um, Asian people brought there by the British to do various particular jobs and various middle-class jobs and shopkeeping and other things. Um, and so there's a... Basically, people were getting expelled from those countries and they wanted to come to Britain and they had British passports. And so in the day and the night, the, the, the Labour government decided, no, you don't have a British passport anymore. Um, and um, to make it clear, the Immigration Act, which is the Tories now, stopped all primary immigration into this country, by which we mean anyone who's not connected to someone else who's already here, not a relative, then you're not coming from India or the, or the, or the Caribbean into this country. Um, you've got to kind of... Uh, uh, the, the SUS laws, which we'll hear about shortly, um, but the Vagrancy Act of um, 1834 um, was brought, 1824, was used um, in the immigration context as well, um, so that uh, immigration officers were allowed to use reasonable suspicion to go on their, their hunts for so-called illegal immigrants. Um, and so that created quite a lot of fear in some Asian communities, um, you know, of not so much necessarily that you are going to get done, but there's always that perva all pervasive fear um, that there could be a knock at the door at the factory or even at your home. Um, and so they created a deliberate climate of fear to put off anyone else from trying to get into this country. Um, quite familiar to us, I think, guess today, um, but um, the Illegal Immigration Intelligence Unit that was formed in this period um, was a special police unit that, surprise, surprise, used lots of spies. Um, 
we know they've been doing that for what's been coming out recently um, in, in the press in terms of work um, infiltrating protest groups, um, political parties. I think there'll be more to come out on that. Um, but suffice to say, they use lots of informers and spies inside the community. Again, ratchet, ratcheting up the fear level and trying to make people suspicious of each other and so on. Um, you had horrors like the, uh, the virginity test that was used at the airports, um, gynecological tests that were forced on Asian women, um, which carried on way up until 1979. It was only when The Guardian did a, a report and there was an outcry in India from the Indian government about the, how an Indian teacher had been treated, but eventually um, it was stopped. Um, so all of these campaigns together created a, you know, a focus around uh, anti-immigration controls, uh, uh, propaganda and campaigns. Um, and by the end of the 70s, I think mean, campaign against racist laws, which the SWP was involved in setting up alongside many others, brought something like 20,000 people onto the streets. Um, probably the largest march to date, I think, um, against, specifically against immigration controls. Um, and to stand back from that, I think it's worth saying that the position of revolutionaries vis-a-vis -vis immigration controls is that we're against all immigration controls. Um, because capitalism is a global system that uh, creates its profits out of workers, whatever their colour, whatever their nationality, and wherever they happen to live. And therefore, we're in favour of um, working people being allowed to follow that money wherever it happens to be. And secondly, probably for a more important reason, we're actually socialists because we think that actually black and white have a joint unity and we are one class regardless of whether we live in Egypt or we live in, in, in London. So our position was no immigration controls, full stop. Um, and you know, the revolutionary left could get a hearing for that, but actually the majority of people, even those against immigration controls, thought we were a bit loony, surely you have to have some kind of controls. But you know, it's not what you can make. Anyway, we've got 20,000 people onto the streets um, to protest against those uh, uh, racist immigration controls. Um, this issue of police racism, which, as I said, immigration controls concerned one section of the community and others outside of it, but primarily one section, or affected more one section. Um, whilst police racism um, tended to affect uh, the, the African Caribbean uh, population more, although, of course, there was harassment of Asian people, of course, so there were Asian people beaten up by the police, of course, and so on. Um, but um, I guess it, to some extent, fits with various colonial and racial prejudices they had about the difference between Asian and uh, African Caribbean people as well. But anyway, um, as you know, uh, lots of uh, uh, black people congregated in the, in the cities of, um, of the big cities of Britain, not because people loved the particular inner city they might happen to be in, but because it was the run-down part of town that no one else wanted to live in. Um, so I think it's worth just mentioning that when they talk about how um, ethnic minorities like to live apart and like to uh, um, keep apart from the rest of society, blah, blah, blah. It's just drivel. It's quite the opposite, actually. Um, just that they're not allowed to live anywhere else and they couldn't get anywhere else to live, so they have to live in the, in the shitholes in the inner cities. Um, so it wasn't uh, because one people wanted to be in a, in a segregated situation. Not that it was totally segregated anyway. Um, anyway, so that's where people lived. And um, it's you know, a time of, um, I guess, you know, because we're in 2013 and things are, are better, things have moved on. Um, and there's all sorts of problems with what's still going on. And racism is still here and, and, and alive and kicking. Um, but we don't have, for example, Love Thy Neighbour, which is a TV show some of you might be familiar with. Hopefully you're not familiar with it, actually. It was meant to be a comedy. It was meant to be poking fun at the racists. Because you know, a black family moves in next door to a white family and all the fun and hilarity that can ensue. And um, so this was meant to be poking jokes at the racists, but you no. Know, to us, lot, it came across just like pure racism, you know, because it relied on stereotypes. It's just built around stereotypes, and it wasn't very funny at all. I had another one called um, Till Death Us Depart, Till, Till Death Us Depart, which is actually written by a left-wing person, a socialist, who thought it was a good idea to poke fun at the racists by telling racist jokes and stuff in the plot lines and all the rest of it. Again, it wasn't very funny and didn't do the job of uh, undermining racism either, particularly. Um, but, you know, if you like... If you like, that's where anti-racism was. Um, pretty, pretty backward stuff. On the football terraces, you know, we have problems with racism still to this day. But back in those days, um, I, mean, I went to the old football match. Um, I was living in Cambridge. Went to see Cambridge, and they had one or two. Uh, they had one black player who, you know, was routinely abused by the Cambridge fans. <laughs> it wasn't the away. You know, it was my, you know, he's black, so let's get him. Um, and of course, being a fan in that situation, although I didn't get beaten up particularly because I was black or anything, so. Um, couldn't have been totally horrendous. But anyway, that's, that was a situation. Not very good. Um, and combined with that, who were the most racist people in society? Of course, it was the police. Um, and I guess we have to be sort of scientific about this. It wasn't just that the police attracted people who are thugs and bullies, which they do do that. 
but it's also the position of police playing capitalist society, which is uh, as a key part of the state, is to maintain the rule of one class over another. So if that's your day job, your day job is to keep people down, you're going to adopt, if you haven't got those ideas already, you're going to adopt and adapt to racist ideas and adapt to anti-working class ideas that all kids that live in an estate who are poor are going to be the ones we need to look, uh, sort out. You're going to adapt to all of those prejudices um, and be the worst people for holding those kind of prejudices. Um, and so the, the Vagrancy Act we talked about earlier, uh, 1824 Vagrancy Act, Obviously, you know, the ruling class has been keeping us down for some time before black people were here. That's why they had the Vagrancy Act. And um, it was known colloquially as the Sus Laws, but it basically gave carte blanche to the police to stop any black person in, in the street or Asian person in the street at will. Um, combined with that, there was a big campaign that started in the 70s against mugging. It was a word imported from New York, but it basically was a race, racialized way of talking about uh, street robbery. So instead of just talking about street robbery as street robbery, they talked about street robbery as a particularly specific black urban crime called mugging. And the National Front put up posters against mugging all over London with uh, what seemed like a black face kind of dripping down onto the streets. Um, and, you know, the whole subtext is, um, you know, these people are uh, attacking old white old ladies in the streets and mugging them for their uh, pension uh, money and so on. Um, so the police saw, saw the black people as a problem. Um, they were quite happy to see them as a problem, given their racist mindset. Um, they even came out of a white paper on police immigrant relations in 1973. Um, and a bit from it, a small minority of young colored people anxious to imitate behavior amongst the black community in the US. Um, they thought this was a big problem, and they were probably right. Um, it would be a problem for them. Um, and the scene for confrontations kind of set up. They got ready for it on, on their side, most definitely. Um, the special patrol group, which is a bit like the territorial support group thing they have today. Um, same operation, kind of a semi-militarized um, police units that can move around very, very, uh, very, very quickly. Um, um, which they started to deploy in the inner cities um, to get a flavour of you know, exactly where the police were coming from, if anyone's got any doubts that's about what they're about. Um, in 77, this is a few years into lots of their violence, um, in Lewisham, for example, they had a stop and search operation with the nice code name Police Nigger Hunt. Um, you know, so I guess that kind of sums up really where the police were at, it was to be black people. Um, so the fight back began in Brockwell Park Fair in, back in 19... 73, um, over no, an incident of a, a young black kid getting arrested. Um, there was an explosion, again in Chapel Town in Leeds in 1975, which blew apart the idea that this is just a thing down south. Um, actually, some black people didn't even know that there were black people in Leeds, that happens, but <laughs> yes, there are. And uh, in Chapel Town, um, another inner city, I would say inner city shithole, but it sounds really not very nice to people in Leeds, but another inner city area, which is uh, quite run down. Um, in Notting Hill, um, again, in a massive way uh, uh, 19, in 1976. Why was Notting Hill important? And it was basically the biggest urban insurrection in Britain since uh, Cable Street, um, when we stopped the fascists in the east end of London in 1936. Uh, in this confrontation, this was at the Notting Hill Carnival, obviously. The carnival, um, I think it was the idea of uh, fellow traveller, well, actually I think she was a member of the Communist Party back in the 50s, who thought it was a good idea to bring people together. I thought I mentioned that, it's important that you have political people uh, involved in these things, that's what makes them better usually. Anyway, it was a good idea, and it, it lived on, and it got bigger and bigger every year, and 1976 was the biggest yet. Um, but the police used it as an excuse every year, as they do at the moment, um, to harass black kids um, in massive numbers, and they mobilised in their thousands to do just, just that. But um, they didn't um, expect uh, the response that they did get which is that 300 police ended up injured and 35 police vehicles were either destroyed or damaged. Um, that was a huge uprising um, compared to like Tottenham riot, I think we took out two police cars or something. Um, but you know, this was big. Um, and also the states, well, they, they had a special patrol group, which is only a bit late actually, I think at this point, they were still running around with um, dustbin lids and stuff to stop the rocks um, um, hitting their heads and stuff. So they weren't as prepared as they should have been perhaps. Um, um, and you know, the day, the day after the riots, we heard a lot about you know, it was a race riot, 
um, which infers that there's less slight black people running wild attacking any white person they can get their hands on, which actually is not what happens. Uh, it, was, it was black and a few white people as well, but mostly black people um, fighting back against police harassment and brut um, brutality. Um, the state didn't just fight us on, on the streets, they also used, um, used the courts. Um, there's a famous case that people might know of, uh, the Mangrove Club that was um, raided by the police repeatedly in the 70s over Labrook Grove Way in West London, near Notting Hill. Um, and the police decided to eventually to shut it down in 1970, and there was a big trial, um, which came, which happened in 71, which exposed massive police corruption um, and racism. And a couple of the defendants um, in that trial, the 12 people, got, got, got quitted eventually by the jury. Um, Frank Critchlow and Darkus Howe, who were two leading lights of the movement um, in those days. Um, and so they didn't succeed in, um, in, in that respect, but they, kept, they carried on. They took other people to court. The um, editor of a radical magazine called Grassroots um, was charged with encouraging the murder of persons unknown. And what was, the, what was the crime of the editor of Grassroots? But he basically republished an article from the US Black Panther paper um, on how to make petrol bombs, which he probably didn't need to do, actually. I think people knew how to make petrol bombs, but anyway. Um, so um, immigration controls and police racism are the two dominant concerns people, people faced in the, the different communities that made up Black Britain um, in that time. Um, but... You know, people live their lives, they do that by having to earn a wage, this is capitalism. Um, so, you know, it's worth looking at the employment patterns uh, and the workplace struggles that took place in this period as well, because they can get often kind of buried and lost in history, um, or lost to history. And um, again, there was a slight there's, you know, kind of division of labour, if you like, inside the division of labour, which was... Um, Afro-Caribbeans tended to get pushed into so-called services industries, uh, service industries, um, such as transport and health service, post office, and so on. Whilst Asian people tended to get pushed into the textile industry in the northern um, cities and towns, for example, um, in the mills, in the light industry, especially in the Midlands, um, and also in very dangerous jobs, and that included African-Caribbeans as well in industry, such as in plastics and in foundries and such like, where you've got you know, big, huge open fires that you can melt in if you get too near and stuff. They go for those kind of shit jobs to the black people. Um, so there's kind of a division of labour there. Um, and so uh, different disputes that, that sprang up as uh, black and Asian workers sought to contest the rate of exploitation, how much they're getting ripped off by the bosses, and also to fight racism. That also meant the racism of the bosses and, unfortunately, the racism of some union leaders and some union bureaucracies and some union, in, some union members. Um, so crepe sizes in Nottingham in 1972, there was quite a, a famous strike, where two-third Asian workforce, um, some doing up to 84 hours a week um, to get £40 pounds in 40 money back then, um, Imperial back then, um, and they had worse conditions than the white workers, they had worse toilet facilities than the white workers, they had a worse canteen or maybe no canteen uh, than, uh, when compared to uh, the white workers. Um, so many of them began to join the union and for doing that five of them were sacked. This all sounds very familiar to us, it's nothing much has changed in terms of how the bosses react to trade unions. Um, and there was an unofficial strike, again that's not necessarily news to us either, but workers have to go ahead of their unions to get things done. So they had an unofficial strike, um, and it was eventually made official, but only after a big campaign by left union branches and others in the, in the community. Um, and it was a strike that actually ended in victory. Mansfield Hosiery in Loughborough, again in the Midlands. Um, here another group of Asian workers, mostly Asian workers, after higher wages and promotion, again, Black and Asian workers often kept out the best jobs and therefore couldn't get promoted, get stuck in the, in, the, in the rubbish jobs. Here Asian workers wanted higher wages and promotion. All workers, um, after the workers occupied the union office, they managed to get the union to uh, make, the, make the strike official. Initially the union didn't want to do that. Um, after about 12 weeks they won over the wages, but the union, um, horrendously, the union refused to actually call out the white workers, so they only called out the, the black section of the factory and left the, left the white workers in there. 
and um, refused to address the whole issue of promotion. So people got a wage rise, so it was a partial victory, it got a wage rise, but you know, the union leadership was still backward um, and didn't really want to actually prosecute the struggle properly um, and, it, and take on the whole question about promotions. And so they pandered to the racism inside uh, among, among white workers. Um, among African Caribbean workers, you had um, probably smaller scale struggles actually. For example, Stanmore Engineering um, in West London. Uh, when I was, again, that was over wages. And this time we had the uh, AUEW, which is the Engineers Union. And I think it's probably worth saying here that the previous industries we talked about the textiles, but left wasn't very well organised. But in engineering, we were very well organised. And in the car plants, very well organised, which fundamentally meant the Communist Party was well organised. Uh, and controlled quite a lot of places, um, and therefore they're a lot more political um, and anti-racist. Um, so, yeah, the AUEW paid strike pay from day, I'm not quite sure if it was day one actually, but it did pay strike pay eventually. Um, but the strike actually went down, it was over wages, um, because the union refused to call for solidarity action. Um, and back in those days, you, there was a lot of solidarity action that did happen. Um, if it was called for by the union, or if there's a strong rank and file organisation, you could get it going. But they didn't get it going, and that's, that strike failed. ITT, another uh, strike at engineering, um, mostly uh, black workers, African Caribbean background. Um, this strike was opposed by the um, ETU, which is Electrical Trades Union, which is a kind of a craft union, which is like you defend position, your position, but to hell with everyone else because you've got nice wages and stuff. Um, and that was their attitude. Um, there was support from the local branch of the uh, engineers, but nationally the union refused to support it, and that lost too. I think just worth saying that these defeats that we've seen weren't defeats because the leadership was a white leadership, as they're the defeats because we had talking about a trade union bureaucracy that was in the habit of not fighting uh, and preferred not to fight uh, when it had to. Obviously, there was the issue of racism as well, but that could be taken on. If it was taken on head on, you could get somewhere. Um, I haven't got time, but Imperial Type writers are probably the best known of these, of these disputes. Again, involving lots of Asian workers, 1974, two-thirds Asian women had come from Uganda, the TNG, Transport General Workers Union of the time, now probably part of Unite the Union. Um, why don't we have union names that tell you what people do? But anyway, Transport General Workers Union sounds to me much better. Refused to take, uh, take back um, uh, to, to support the strike. Um, eventually it, won, it wins after solidarity from left-wing union branches from the Sikh temple Indian Workers Association which was quite a powerful organization in, the, in, the, in those days um, and then what I think is an important lesson from this strike was that although it won then um, a few months later the US parent company, company Littons decided that they had too much output in in Britain they had to close some factories um, and there's a factory in Hull that was threatened to closure and Imperial typewriters in Leicester that was threatened. And the workers in Hull occupied the factory, didn't get closed. The workers in Imperial typewriters that had a history of racism, unfortunately, because white workers carried on working in, this, in Imperial typewriters, um, actually weakened our fight. And that's the, that's, that's the place that got shut down, which is a solitary lesson in white class unity. It's not just an empty thing we talk about. It matters both in terms of people's ideas in their heads and overcoming racism, but also in actually winning. Um, so that was a shame. Um, and then, of course, Grunwick's. Have I got five minutes left? Is that right? Yeah. Jeez. Um, yeah, Grunwick, which is, a, which is a course celeb of the trade union movement of the 1970s, 76, which saw again another group of Asian uh, women workers, um, but the boss thought you could just roll over. Also, another salutary lesson in um, cross class alliances and so on, because the boss was not a white British person, he was an Anglo Indian. Um, Someone part of the usually part of uh, you know Indian ruling class that bought into and married into uh, parts of the colonial. British ruling class, um, and he owned this factory, film reprocessing in factory in West Lon London, and um, he refused to recognise the union. So the women started to fight, um, the unions dragged their heels, but the left inside the trade union movement in Britain said, yes, we're going to support you, um, and the whole situation was transformed from what appeared to be just a minority, just a group of Asian women fighting alone, into a movement which actually brought in behind it some of the strongest battalions, if you like, of the working class movement in Britain. Um, so, you know, when Arthur Scargill turns up with uh, Yorkshire miners and you have a mass pick of 20,000 people, there in practice you can see the reality of what class unity means. You know, you come all these workers who, you know, have a common interest to these Asian women, immigrant women, because they're trying to get union recognition and they understand what union recognition means, something they fought for for generations in, in the pits, mines of, of, of Britain. Um, that strike didn't win because of uh, lack of solidarity, not a lack of solidarity, because of the, 
There was solidarity that the post workers wanted to offer, which is a word called blacking, which comes from tarring and feathering people, so you turn them black, so it's not a racial thing as such. Um, but there wasn't any blacking. That's what the workers wanted to do. They wanted to stop these um, film processes moving from the plant so they couldn't actually do any trade. Uh, and the posties were up for doing it, but the union bureaucracy didn't want, get, didn't want to get taken to court, so they weren't up for doing it, and the, and the, and the fight went down. Um, the racist violence um, that took place in this period, the fight against uh, the National Front, um, this was one which actually mobilised across both parts of uh, the Asian and the African Caribbean um, came together. This was a joint uh, effort, if you like. Um, <coughs> The National Front was um, making a lot of headway in the early, early, early 70s. Um, and they started uh, getting so cocky that they decided to start having marches through uh, immigrant areas to, to spread terror and, and intimidate um, the left as well. Um, it was a very, very serious situation. Um, and they, set to, they seemed to be on a roll. But it all came to a shuddering halt in Lewisham in 1977, um, when an alliance basically of... Uh, the SWP and black youth and others came together, about 5,000 strong, and, and broke through the police lines who kept protecting these Nazi marches and parades, and uh, broke through the police lines and destroyed their, destroyed their march. And on the back of that, the Anti-Nazi League was, uh, was, able to be, was, was formed, um, and it was successful in as far as its limited objective was. Um, uh, that it had, which was to stop fascism in this country, was to understand that fascism wasn't just about racism, it was also about racism, but it was about an anti-working class movement that just wanted to destroy democracy. It was a mortal threat, not just to black people, but to all trade unionists and Democrats in this country. And it organised on that basis to get the widest possible support, but then to actually go into militant action on the streets to actually stop these people organising, and also in the schools, offices, and everywhere else in society to actually galvanise people and spread the word about anti-racism and anti-fascism, anti which it did massively successfully in terms of millions and millions of posters and pamphlets and, and, and stuff. Uh, badges that we sold and all the rest of it, I um, remember in, in, in my school. Um, must have been successful. Um, but, and it built up the Asian youth movement, movements as well, which grew up independently and as a response to the racist violence being meted out in our communities, the Asian youth movement um, came, to, came to the fore, a political movement, people who from that SWP and other um, revolutionary socialist far left groups, IMG and others who'd been in and out of various organisations, um, but um, had were willing to work alongside the white left, were willing to work alongside others in order to actually uh, 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 fight back against uh, uh, the Nazis. Um, and uh, I think Robert Ralph, one of the fascists, put up a sign in one, outside one of his properties about for sale to an English person only, which is a total, totally illegal breach of the of, uh, Race Relations Act, blah, blah. Um, and a comrade from IS, actually, I think it was, um, went and stole the sign and it didn't reappear until there was an Asian South Hall Youth Movement demonstration a few days later, which it was uh, ceremonially uh, burned, um, which kind of um, was nice. And um, people argue that well, the A&L only went so far, it had limited objectives, it had limited objectives, true. And but really, it didn't do its job because really Margaret Thatcher stole all the clothes, that's what really happened. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't really tackle racism either. Well, the truth is, you know, I think we need to look at it from the point of view of the Nazis, what they said about it, um, for example. Um, I think it was um, Martin Webster who said that um, we were harried at every turn. If it wasn't for the Anti-Nazi League, we'd have been able to recruit, but we couldn't recruit because they wouldn't let us. Um, so basically, we destroyed their organisation. So regardless of whatever Margaret Thatcher said or didn't say in the 17th election, they couldn't get anything out of it because they didn't have the organisation on, on the ground in the same way they, they had built up into the, into the mid-70s. Uh, mid um, and the, the whole question of fighting racism, actually that's why I'm in the Socialist Workers' Party, because the idea that you can have a campaign against racism and, and, and racism, this thing is fundamental. It's like having a campaign, of course you can have campaigns against things, but it doesn't, you know, it's so fundamental to the way the system operates. You can have a certain number of reforms vis-a-vis -vis racism or vis-a-vis -vis women's oppression, you can have a certain number of reforms, but Unless we keep fighting, those reforms get taken away, but those reforms fundamentally don't actually alter the balance of class forces and how those societies work. And because it's a class society, it needs some kind of ideology to divide people, so that it's built, so racism is built into the system. So the idea that you can just have a campaign, anti-racist campaign, well, it's good for dealing with specific things and so on, but you have to have a campaign that deals with this whole society. That's the whole point. Um, you know, so you have to, if you're, thoroughgoing anti-racist, I believe, that you need to actually take on board the issue of actually getting rid of capitalism, because that's what creates racism in, in, in the first place. Um, so to sum up, 
because I have a lot I haven't said, which I was intending to say, um, but to, to sum up, basically by the end of uh, coming into the 80s, we have a situation from where we move from open confrontation with the state and then the big riots of 81, which were class riots as well as anti-racist riots, where you had black and white kids together in the early days of factorism, when they massively increased uh, unemployment, huge youth unemployment, huge despair on the streets, and the racist police are still there as well. And they come together in riots that spread from mixed into Toxtef for all over the country and they become called copycat riots as if somehow these were lesser affairs. They're actually all driven by the same thing, even in places like Gloucester, where there are riots which police racism and unemployment. This starts race and class coming together. And actually that's how we see getting rid of racism as well, because it's not in the interests of white workers, but racism is prevalent, because all it means is that you have worse conditions, you have worse wages, um, and the bosses get fatter. Um, and actually on the, on the contrary, it's in our, it's in our class interest to move together and in, in, in that process of successful struggle, uh, then we can actually begin to break down the barriers that um, they want to, to divide us with, of, of race and so on. Um, so unfortunately, as I move away from that kind of outward looking struggle, it wasn't just down to the heads of the people, inside people's heads of various leaders, what have you, it was something fundamental going on, which was uh, how the movement in the States went as well, which was if you're not moving forward and the class doesn't break through, I mean, we, we almost did, six to eight, in terms of when I said, you know, general strikes instead of the working people taking the stage of history, and actually really, stopping the ruling class and the dead in their tracks, this is what needs to happen in Egypt, it's coming soon, hopefully, um, that sort of thing. Um, instead, we start to go backwards, there are less strikes in Britain and so on. Um, we've got a Labour government that kind of sapped the strength out of the unions in this country. Um, and then when people are getting defeated in that way, then people start to look inwards. And so you've got all the different oppressed groups start to take on the ideas of identity politics. Um, so the, the idea that actually it's not the system that we're angry against what we might be, but fundamentally it's, you know, if I'm a black person, it's a white person that's the problem here. If I'm a, I'm a woman, it's the patriarchal men that are a problem, and also straight people if I'm a, a gay person. What's before, actually, the Gay Liberation Front was, you know, of the left, you know, it came out of the, of the mass movement, it deliberately used, used the word Liberation Front as a reference to Vietnam. You know, the things were connected, people had connectedness. Um, you even had something called a white Panther Party in the United States where people tried to make the connection in a very strange way, but they still tried to make the connection between black and white struggle coming together and stuff. And so by the 80s, things were going the other way. And that was a reflection of the downturn in the level of class struggle, if you like. Uh, but also, it was a test of the political ideas that were around at the time. I'll finish here, um, read more in the book, but uh, the Race Today Collective, we mentioned Darkest Howe from that, uh, that trial. Um, those sort of people, when the 81 riots happened, they argued that basically we needed to set up black uh, self-defense uh, groups in all of these areas. Um, and so ended up having a big argument about we have to have black defence groups, black defence groups, which is all very nice, but it meant that we ended up not having any defence groups, so it was black and the white kids all went to prison together. Um, you know, so, excuse me, and these were, because these were struggles that involved thousands and thousands of white kids, as a I think Guardian journalist said of the Moss Side riots, this was the first white army I've seen led by black generals. Um, you know, these were riots over unemployment and racism together. Um, so, to finish, the Labour Party black sections, they had great success in getting more black representation, which of course we're in favour of. The whole identity politics that went into racism and awareness training people might be familiar with, where you re-educate white people out of being racist, or you educate black people as well to be more assertive and stuff. All that kind of started to happen in the, in the 80s, which on the surface sounded well, at least they're doing something you might think, or whatever, but the trouble is this was kind of anti-racism from the top looking down. It's not something that we controlled, and it was totally shorn from any connection to the social conditions that breed racism. So there's no point having re-education um, unless you actually deal with the conditions that create racism in the first place, because it can become uneducated again as soon as they leave the classroom. Um, you know, so we don't get much of rat anymore, racism awareness training. I guess it probably still does happen somewhere in the public sector. I don't know. We'll call it something different, like anti-racism initiative or something. But anyway, these things happen. Now, of course, we defend them against the right wing in the press. We attack all of these things and talk about the loony lefties trying to ban nursery rhymes and blah, blah. Lots of more lies. But actually, we def def defend these anti-racist initiatives, but the problem with them was that they were from the top. And so you had like the Burnage report uh, into a killing of a uh, black uh, Asian kid in his school by a white kid. And there's a report done on it, and they looked at it, and, and the, 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 school, the people running the school, the head and whatever, decided that, oh, well, it means that all white people must be racist, therefore we're not going to let his white friends go to his funeral. What? <laughs> you know, and those kind of things got up, were, were exposed, and then the press jumps on it and twists it into an attack on anti racism. So we have to defend those kind of reports, although the council refused to publish it in Manchester, but it was, came out in another form. Um, but it just goes to show that unless you have a, it's the movement from below, there in the first place, then you know, anti-racism has to come out of the struggle, out of the struggles I talked about uh, over the past, uh, past half an hour. Um, 
and in the future, we're living with the same contradiction, I think, and it's that sort of going to sort things out. Uh, fundamentally, in terms of fighting racism, a contradiction between um, a minority, which black and Asian people are in this country, and a bigger majority, uh, which is overcome in terms of class. It's worth working with people together that we can fight, but only together that can only be done on the basis of being the most consistent fighters against racism, racism and not pandering to, pandering to racism, um, which is what the Socialist Workers' Party tries to do, and, and, to, and to take that into action, don't just talk about it, you have to judge people about what, what they say, I'm a great believer in that. Um, and so those people here who aren't members to join us, because every single person matters in your factory, your office, your school. Yeah. Yes, uh, bring back old memories. Uh, I think for the Asian people, the experience was uh, largely different. Because uh, as we all know that uh, measures of war, there was a lot of demand for the labor in this country. And uh, initially the, the government had a uh, lot of discussion in the cabinet, some of them saying that uh, they don't want uh, black relations coming here as a group for the in grants in the European countries like in Italy, etc. But uh, they didn't get many, so the Asian and blacks were allowed to come here. They had the right anyway, being the members of Congress, so they had the right to come. Mm. Uh, but uh, in India, the Nehru was the Prime Minister at the time, and he did not want the Indians to leave India. He was saying that uh, the, because just they got again, independence. The world is going to think that somehow India can't feed its own people. So he was against uh, letting people out. But uh, people who have come from Pakistan, so initially the Indians, mainly Punjabis, they crossed the border over to Pakistan in the around 1950 or And they used to live in Pakistan as, uh, hide, in hiding, then they come over land. And then uh, Nehru said that uh, uh, graduates can go to England if they want to study. So a lot of people who were graduates, they start getting a uh, place in this uh, country in the universities, and then they need to start working. That's how my eldest brother came here in 1963. Uh, so 1960. Uh, well, he arrived, my cousin was here, he said, my brother arrived at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. At 6 o'clock, he was working in the bakery. And the foreman was asking, have you got any more brothers and cousins who can come here? <laughs> there were so many jobs at the time, and there was such a demand. And, uh, but uh, also in 1960, then there was the economic crisis, and then the economic power, the river blood speech. Well, I think uh, the impact that her speech had is probably not uh, understood by many people, how it uh, led to this attacks all around the country. <coughs> in fact, uh, I can remember that it's like, it's like it's a wave of racist attacks coming to the end of mass media all the right-wing papers. They were using this really disgusting uh, kind of like a petty bashing. And almost daily you read in the front page of the Daily Mail saying so many packages of bashed by skin are in so and so place. And uh, I myself used to live in Graveland at the time of a student when the uh, same thing uh, happened in Graveland. So we formed uh, a youth organization uh, to get the Asian youth together to fight against the racist attacks. And uh, that was called the the Indian Youth Federation of Great and the very first Asian Youth Organization in this country in 1969, and I was the founding president of that. And uh, immediately afterwards, and I think Gary or Mesh co uh, immediately the Labour Party, they wanted me to join the Labour Party, and they were saying that uh, you were the very first Asian council in this country, then maybe of a first Asian MP, because at the time there were no Asian MPs. And the first Asian councillor was elected in 1970 in Southall. But a few years I, I, you know, I knew what they, they were like. And a few years later, when I first, uh, met the, uh, came in front of the Social Works Party, and I found that they were the best fighter against the of fascism, and that's why I joined the uh, Social Party in 1974. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jamie. Um, just a question, really, about um, language. Something that I uh, felt quite passionate about in the past is that language is something that we've created, and it's something that we should be masters of. But the reality of it is, we seem to be slaves to it. And uh, in terms of the issue, do you think that the term racism is the term that we should be using to describe the problem? 
because uh, it implies that everyone in this room is on a different rates from one another, like on oh, different rates from each other. Mm -hmm. All of these two people are different rates from each other, but we're not different races, we're all human, and that's the, that's the issue with the, the terminology of calling it racism, I believe. Um, the issue that we're uh, but the, really, the problem is really is, is fear for ignorance, and, and that's our common problem. Is it's people's fear for ignorance, and the only way to change that is through having positive uh, engagement with people from different cultures. Uh, Terence McKenna famously said once that uh, culture is not a friend. So basically, that's the, the main question. Do you think that the term racism should be one used yeah. to explain the struggle? I like almost um, I'm thinking about it from a heavy socialist work party. Um, um, I, I was a young boy growing up in the uh, 1970s and early 80s, what Gary was talking about. And I can remember the racism of the police, actually, the SAS laws. I can remember growing up and seeing people being beaten up by the police in the streets and people crying about it. I remember when I was a young life, guy um, watching a, a man being beaten up by two white men and we were shouting for the police. It turns out these two people men, uh, white men were the police. So I remember walking through Hoxton. I lived in Hoxton in East London at the time, telling uh, people that you lived in Hoxton was like telling you that you lived in Rome and Manabella. It was the National World War Front used to have um, a cell down there and I remember being spat out as a young boy with my, uh, with my then, it was, uh, my then four-year-old sister. And um, it was really, really horrific. But actually, I think that we talked about the battles that united people, you know, the, uh, the fight against the, the, uh, the, the, the formation of the Eighth Dance League, the struggles, and how there's been a real cultural shift in that. And I'll tell you, the biggest compliment I think I've had is because actually the reason why I'm political, the reason why I'm a member of the Society Party, and the reason I'm a member of United States of now, is because I remember the difference it made on the streets. I remember people complaining, I remember people coming out of lollipops, I remember going from a situation where you felt fair to actually see the big anti-racist movement and thinking actually this is giving you confidence and you know now that actually you're not all white people are racist, you know actually that you can come together and that you can fight things. And I think it's really, really brilliant. But I think the biggest compliment that I've had about that is that I work with young people and I remember um, telling, my, telling one of the young people I work with about, about, my, about my childhood and he said to me, you know what Dean, my uncle needs to tell me stories like that. I just can't imagine things like that happening now. And I think the reason why that's important is because actually a generation of black youth now have not had to go through those problems. And that is, that is because of the political struggles that we fought and that have been fought. I want to come up to a couple of points that people have raised. Um, the stuff about black culture, about black culture being subsumed, actually the reason why black culture is popular, popular is because actually we have a far more integrated society now than we had when I was growing up. And when you look at what's happening is, it's not the case that white people think, oh, actually, I'm into black culture because it's black. It's because it's what they grew up in. I've got a 13-year-old mixed son, and my son doesn't actually, you know, make a distinguish. He doesn't talk about black culture. He talks about the culture that he and his friends are into, the types of music him and his friends are into, and it's the stuff in that which is being, 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 being seen as the norm. And your point about language, actually, racism is not just about words. Racism is actually an economic and political system. When we talk about racism, I'll tell you what racism means. Racism means that 50% of black males between 16 to 24 are unemployed in London. That's what racism means. It doesn't mean that we're the way we talk to each other and relate to each other as individuals. It's a political system which, is, which, which really, really oppresses us, which is why it's really important to fight. Because when we talk about the crisis of black leadership, actually, I'm a, I'm a shop steward. And there's a black workers group in my, in my, in my, where I work. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a member of Eastern Union, and I'm on the shop stewards. When it talks about mobilising against the EDL, when we talk about fighting against racism, actually, black workers group are not the people who are doing it. Actually, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you set, get, lots of, in, get lots of invitations to cultural events, and you have lots of discussions about why there's not enough black managers within the council. But when actually we talk about fighting on the streets, when it comes to mobilising against the EDL, when it comes to actually organising and fighting strikes, that is actually done by the main, by the main majority. And actually, my team, the vast majority of my team are black, black women. And yeah, I'm the person who goes in with socialist worker. We talked about this 20 years after Stephen Lawrence. I'm the person who goes in and does that. And actually, for us, as individuals are socialists, you know, a lot of people take the term of the white left. 
But the fact of the matter is, actually, by making that link between fighting races and making and fighting class, you know, and, and linking class struggles together, we're the best anti racist fighters. So it's important that, you know, we fight racism, but actually, we don't need to go down dead any modes where we talk about this language or we, we look at things culturally. We need to make sure that we bring that struggle, those struggles together. Okay, that's me over there. It was also to reply to the person who said, um, should we really talk about racism because does race really exist? Aren't we all one race? And you see, I see completely where you're coming from because race is a totally artificial concept. It's true, we are all part of the same human race if you want to use the kind of, you know, hippy dippy sort of term. We, but it is actually biologically true that actually what divides us isn't our race, it's, it's an invention. Um, and actually, it's not just the historians who prove this, it's the biologists prove this. If you actually look at the DNA of different human beings, it's been proved that race is, is not a biological um, phenomenon. It's something that has been socially constructed. But because it's been socially constructed and is so endemic in the way that society is organised, it's something that we have to deal with. And we can't deal with it just by saying it doesn't exist. I think we have to start from saying it doesn't exist and it's a social construct. But then we have to say it has become the basis of huge inequalities and of huge amounts of injustices and oppression. And that means that we have to talk not about races, but about the struggle against racism. And therefore, I think we have to talk about racism. And you see, when, it, when we come on to where we are today, I think it's interesting <coughs> listening to the discussion, particularly people who talk about growing up in the 70s um, and, um, and earlier, people who are talking about earlier, about actually, in some ways, we seem to have come a long way in Britain today because a lot of the crudest ideas about, you know, they do surveys every year about uh, where they ask white people, would you, would you let your daughter marry a black person? Although I don't really see why it's any of their business what their daughter does, but this is another question. But they ask a lot of things about mixed race relationships and all the rest of it. Some of the crudest ideas about racism have been broken down over the past <coughs> Um, 10, 20 years, but at the same time, we see constant upsurges, don't we? Vicious Islamophobia since the murder in Woolwich, vicious anti immigrant racism that's coming from the top of society. So, on the one hand, you can push these ideas back. I would say, through a mixture of growing integration of people living together, working together, having relationships together, and the struggles that we have side by side in our workplaces and against fascism and racism in every guise. This drives racist ideas back, but they keep coming back for more. And I think that means we have to think about what are the strategies can, that can get us out of this. Every generation has had to fight racism. And when you look at where we are today, you see, I think the reason that what Gary's talking about is so important it's because we have to say, how have we got a situation today where we have more black and Asian MPs in Parliament than we've ever had in Britain, where we have more black councillors than we've ever had in Britain, where we have more black managers, black millionaires, black people with positions of authority in management, in the councils, in the NHS where I work and elsewhere, and yet those people actually are much weaker at actually challenging racism than the people that we saw coming before in the 70s. And that's because... And that's because of all the things that Gary talked about, about the struggles in the 70s that were about taking on the system, about black and white actually confronting the system, then those struggles open the door to a layer of people advancing but leaving the majority of us behind. And when you think about where we are today, I think that gives us an opportunity to build a multiracial struggle against racism, actually that, that draws on the strength of class politics. But we have to say the people who are in power and the people who are the managers, the people who are the millionaires, do not have the same interest that the rest of us have in eliminating racism and in destroying the racist system. And you know, I work in the NHS. The NHS would not exist without black and Asian workers. Something like 20% of nurses and midwives are black and Asian in Britain today. So every struggle that we have for better wages or for our pensions, when we went on strike on November the 30th, that was black and white people fighting together. That in itself won't eliminate racism, but those class struggles start to bring black and white people together in a blow against capitalism. And alongside that, we have to have militant struggles against the, that are willing to confront the state and not just to try and work through the state. And we have to take up every injustice against racism and every miscarriage of justice, but we have to link them to a vision that isn't just about opening the door for a few individuals, it's about changing the system for all of us.
Yeah, Matt from Birmingham, I'm going to give you some work. And I just want to say one comment before I can move, move on to what I really want to talk about. Is that actually there, these, a lot of lessons still exist today. Uh, I know this has been talked about today, but actually I still have to represent a lot of black women workers at work because there's an insidious racism that is still out there, which is that there's an aggressive stereotype of when somebody raises an issue, a black worker it still often seems to be a more, take it as a more, uh, that's stereotypical, you're somehow aggressive on a white worker who raises it, wouldn't be treated in the same way. So I think there is still that tackling of racism at work is still absolutely important for us to do. But I want to say one thing that I think has been missing from this discussion, that's 9-11. You know, if you under, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. How many, most people now growing up in, in the movement are growing up in a post 9-11 world. And that 9-11 absolutely changed, I think, the politics of this country and the racism in this, in this country for the worse. Um, you know, and I think when it was prepared to talk about the of race, is that actually the target of racism has continually changed in Britain. You know, in the 1930s, it was anti-Jewish racism. That was the predominant thing that fascists latched onto. In the 50s and 60s, it was black people and Irish people who bore the main brunt of it. And now, after 9-11, it's predominantly Muslim people, I feel, because actually, if you look at where the oil is, then that, that's where you have to make, make the enemy if you're an imperialist in, in this country. And I think... Um, the EDL wouldn't have got anywhere if it hadn't been for 9-11, actually. I think 9-11 absolutely changed the politics of this, of this country um, for, for the worse, um, in the sense of not the actual 9-11 event, but the excuse it gave to American imperialism and British imperialism to go and attack Afghanistan and Iraq, and therefore they had to construct a different other, as it was, that wasn't there in quite the same way before. They had to make the people from those countries out to be somehow different from they were in order to justify their, their wars overseas. The um, last point I want to make is, is, this, is this one as well, which is actually, um, there are, might not be majority black areas, but in Birmingham there are still what estates that are 90% white people. And actually what we're finding is that when we're fighting against the bedroom tax, for example, that is one of the best ways of us actually confronting the racism that exists. Because we're working alongside a lot of tenants, a lot of working class people, and inside that group, just as any full spectrum of the working class when you get the majority of people involved, you start to find that you're hitting into the racist ideas, because that's the propaganda that's continually coming out. But the easiest way of challenging those racist ideas is when you're marching alongside someone. So when I'm marching alongside someone on the bedroom tax, and they come out with a racist idea, that's when I find it's the easiest place to tackle it, um, is actually when we're marching alongside the Tory government that we're opposed to. Um, hi, my name is Joe. I'm a teacher from uh, Lewisham. Um, and I think one thing we've got to come back to the gentleman who spoke about battling ignorance. I think actually one of our most clear and present dangers currently comes in the guise of Michael Gove, because this is a man who is trying to shift and change our na history national curriculum to convey a very particular idea of what it is to be British. You know, I'm very lucky at the moment to be able to teach about the abolitionists like Equiano and Ignacio Sancho. I'm very lucky to teach about the Warsaw uprisings and, the, and, and things such as this. And he is currently trying to shift and change our curriculum, or we as history teachers are able to teach, to convey, as I say, a very particular version of what it is to be British. And I think that in its very essence is very dangerous because um, being I think one of the joys of my job and one of the things I love the most is every day going into that classroom and just seeing how these kids, we had it yesterday at Sports Day, uh, you know, just coexist together in, in not in perfect unity, I, I have plenty of conflicts to deal with daily, but ultimately <laughs> these are just young people who can exist and be together and enjoy being together and someone like Michael Gove is going to enable uh, a, a situation to arrive where actually there's going to be further division driven between communities when they don't fit into what he's deemed to be what British is. Uh, and I'm sorry, I've been nervous. Uh, and, and the last point I would just say though, um, and why we've got to think about this as unity of class struggle, is that currently our most underperforming group are free school middle white boys. Um, and that in a sense I think is driven by the fact that, that education is such a middle class construct of how it is to be able to achieve and what you need to get out of it. And actually, we need to be able to redistribute the wealth into all working class areas to enable everybody to understand and gain something from it so that we can all uh, share in being British.
Uh, hi, I'm Ken Lynn. I'm a journalist on uh, Socialist Worker. And recently, I've been reading this book. It's a new book, made, made a new book on immigration called The British Dream by David Goodhart, who's a sort of right-wing labourite. And um, I've been really boring my colleagues, uh, because every morning I came to work. So I can't believe the rubbish I've read in this book. <laughs> We're aware of that this is what is becoming mainstream because, as people have said, racism can get work, uh, can get better, and things have got a lot better. And another one of those or people who grew up in the 70s and could won't tell a story because there isn't time. But I will go back to this idea that there was racism in the past, but it's gone away. Um, and this is um, an excerpt. Uh, might be able to tell the marks all the way through of things that you could quote from from Goodhart. But he says about. Um, uh, oppression of uh, young black people. The, the stereotype of oppression is carefully preserved in black street culture and, to some, justifies transgressive behaviour. The fact that the stereotype is, by and large, no longer justified uh, by the uh, attitudes of today's teachers and police officers has not been enough. It may take several more decades of largely positive experiences to eradicate the bad memories, and that is what we about in the 70s, bad memories didn't happen anymore, um, <laughs> and the righteous aggression. It probably also requires that many more black teachers and police officers uh, part of part. Now the reason I'm quoting this stuff is because this has become the mainstream agenda, that this is the sort of thing which people like, um, what is that, Ed Miliband will be listening to the kinds of likes of Goodhart. It's the sort of person who will be advising them. And I think it, why it's so important that we remember the traditions of how people have fought back and remember um, the, the case the, 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 the struggles that, that people have talked about because people like, like Goodhart are trying to erase them. They're trying to say that there might have been problems in the past, but it's down to usually British um, good heartedness and good sense that we don't have those anymore. And the things that, uh, that show that we do have them, I think, are, are vitally important. Another thing doing work as a journalist is you noticing, hopefully, other people have noticed where there have been shifts and uh, things down to long term struggles. I just want to mention two from the past couple of weeks. One is the, um, the result of the Zell Rodney inquiry, where it's been accepted now, an official inquiry, and he was shot down in the street by the cops. Um, and uh, hopefully there was a similar result coming up with Mark Duggan. I also want to mention the thing about, uh, about Jimmy Mabenga. Now, people may not know about Jimmy Mabenga. He was an Angolan guy who lives in Britain, has a family here, but was being deported, being forced to be deported onto a British Airways uh, flight, and was restrained by three G4S guards, people may know the name of G4S, because the government's giving them bloody everything to do in terms of looking after asylum seekers and all sorts of other people. They restrained him um, and uh, in a way where he suffocated and died uh, before the plane could even take off the tarmac. Luckily, they've just been found guilty of unlawful killing as well. Um, the only thing that about this is that, as far as I'm aware, no one who's ever been found guilty in an inquest of unlawful killing uh, police officers has ever been done in court afterwards. Um, but the fact that, that these cases do come up is entirely down to campaigns, campaigns that um, hopefully people in this room have been involved in, and it's the fact that people keep on fighting that will actually uh, be the thing that challenges the rubbish like this book. Thanks. Can you just uh, can you keep it just for one minute? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep it really short. Um, really interesting, very interesting. Um, I think I very much agree on what you were saying in terms of how, because racism is such a pervasive part of how uh, the, and how rooted it is and within the system that it's, it, you know you can't really have a campaign on racism, but rather on singular points uh, on it. Which is why I think it's really good that the Stand Up to UK campaign is now coming forward because actually I think that is going to open up a space where we can start to generalise. Uh, more anti-racist ideas um, to a high political level as well, and I think that, um, that, that, that like people have been talking about how things have moved forward, and yet at the same time, in a, a lot of ways, they haven't moved forward. And that kind of way that racism is frowned upon, but it isn't really something which is really taken on by the mainstream ideas in society, um, and, and isn't dealt with efficiently. And I think it's kind of two things. One is because of the diverse nature that you see in cities. Uh, and how that's, you know, in urban places actually things are much diverse. You know, if you look at the riots, there was a, you know, a very diverse background of people in the riots, including, you know, in Tottenham, of course, the example that a lot of people talk about is the Hasidic Jews, um, you know, very much involved in the riots that night. So that, that diverse nature of the working class areas and cities means that actually it, it, you can start to see how there is less acceptability 
of uh, racist ideas. But the, the key thing about the Sound Up to You campaign, I think, is that actually, even though th th <coughs> there may be a, re a rejection of open and blatant racism, actually questioning immigration is a slight more uh, difficult one, uh, and an argument which is something that has to be taken up more widely. Um, I, I was uh, a, a couple of things as well. Mm -hmm. When you talked about the oh, one, one thing, I'll just make it one thing. When you talked about um, it, it, uh, the march against immigration laws, about 20,000 people marched, there hasn't mm. really been a march of that size. That's one of the things which is incredibly difficult. Actually, there's so many tragic stories of people who have been deported and either died on route or have been you know, killed on route by the state, effectively, or private companies doing the state's job for it. Deportations is such a huge aspect, well, it's not a huge material aspect, but it's something which continues to uh, actually in, in um, areas where there is a lot of migrants and there is a lot of people who are uh, looking for um, a better life here in the UK, even now today, actually deportations is something which still holds a lot of fear for those families. And I think it's in a way used as a kind of ideological weapon as well. We are shipping these people off, we're getting them out, so you, you know, better keep your head down and get on with your job, um, even if it is 84 hours a week or whatever. So, yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Yeah. Um, yes, standing up to you, Kip, Chaz was saying, actually, no, comment here was the last comment. Um, PDC, um, you mentioned, um, teacher training. It was, just, it was horrific how backward things now are apparently in teacher training, but there's basically there's no anti-racism in it, um, unless someone happens to be there who's going to inject it into it. Um, we didn't get very far down the road, but we got quite a way, but I think it was from below. Um, you know, teachers around, the socialist teachers around the, in the London Education Authority, for example, in the 70s, but a lot of this work was done from below, and it will continue to be done so from below, sort of from socialist teachers, fundamentally, people, anti-racist teachers, who are actually bringing the stuff into the schools. Of course, we want the state to do it as well, but they're taking that in a different direction with the uh, ludicrous British curriculum thing they came out with, which you had to actually backtrack on, which was good, but it was still actually a move uh, away from the idea that uh, anywhere in the world matters apart from the places that Britain conquered um, to people. Um, and obviously, that's a, a retrograde um, step. Um, yes, yeah, Ken was saying, um, no, Jimmy Mabenga, but all these other cases, and I think you know, the British state is very good at um, holding its hands up, but only 20 years, 30 years after the thing actually happens. So uh, there's no struggle to talk about and what have you. They've even done it more recently um, with the Tottenham riots and um, the next one that's going to come up, um, which said, you know, they dragged, dragged it out and dragged it out so that we don't, you know, hoping that things will be diffused um, when that, when that uh, story hits the uh, newspapers as well. Um, I think uh, Joe from Lewisham, a teacher, um, Gove in British history, yeah. Um, I think the bit, the interesting thing was the thing about um, the free school meal uh, white kids, because um, we've had quite a lot of this over the past few years. Um, and um, they tend to use it by um, comparing free school meal white kids to all other kids and saying the free school meal white kids are at the bottom. Now, I'm not going to argue about who's at the bottom, because I think it's, uh, um, you know, we're that's not how we approach these things, but I think it has to be clear that it has been used to suggest that there's been too much done in terms of anti-racism in the education system in Britain, and look where it's left us. It's poor white kids at the bottom. Well, actually, it's not true. You've got the people who got at the bottom are working class people at the bottom. Yeah. Actually, inside of that, you've got a disproportionate number of black boys. If you want to get concrete about it. Um, and actually, there are other people who are ethnic minorities actually doing quite well. Well, if you're middle class Indian, I've got to work with quite a few middle class Indian people, some that originally came from Malawi and elsewhere in East Africa, doing very well in the city of London. Um, so it's different ways to look at this, but fundamentally, uh, and then Chinese people are way above white people um, in the education system. Just look at it like that. But if you look at it from class perspective, you see it's actually these working class people that are losing out, and that's going to accelerate if they keep getting away with destroying more and more comprehensive education. And inside of that, uh, because the class is being attacked, it means actually black people fundamentally, and there are some Asian uh, black people as well who uh, are doing very, very badly just up the road from here uh, um, in, East, in um, Tower Hamlets um, inside the British education system. Um, they'll do proportionally worse inside of that. Um, and the poorest white people will be on maybe on the same, same level. Free, free school meals means you're the poorest is how it's done. Um, but no, anyway, what I'm trying to make the point is that they've been using that argument to actually uh, drive back anti-racism uh, and to blame anti-racism uh, for that when it's actually the Tories themselves and the new Labour before them trying to destroy our education system. Um, Matt from Birmingham, post-11 world, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, 
I've described it, but we really have to do something about it, um, which is why the lessons of the 70s and 80s of all the history of fight against racism is so important so we can put it into practice um, today. And quite clearly, you're absolutely right, Islamophobia is the cutting edge of racism today. If you want to be a successful racist, learn to be an Islamophobic racist. Um, um, and that's how they're, they're building their support, by, by, using, by using that. That's, uh, that's incontrovertibly the truth, which is why we have to build Unite Against Fashion to, to take on uh, the worst elements of that, the English Defence League on, on the streets, but also we have to have a wider argument in society, which means Commerce is right, you know, we've got to take the well, uh, anti-racist argument into everything we do around the campaigns on the, on the estates, on the bedroom tax um, and else, elsewhere. Um, uh, Jamie, language, um, we're slaves to language, is racism the right word? I think as we, you know, covered it, you know, races don't actually exist um, from a genetic point of view, there's more difference between so-called races than there are between the different races. Um, so there's more difference inside the so-called British race, there's not such a thing, but there are between a British person and an African person, because an African person, you know, it's where we all came from, so that's where the gene pool started, if you like. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a proven, it's now a proven fact, they put this stuff on, tend to be kind of like 11 o'clock at night, I've had to tell people about these things, wonderful breakthroughs in, uh, in genetics and so on, so we can actually understand where we came from and the various paths of migration that can be worked out from that, from Africa and so on, it's all very nice. But, um, just because racism doesn't exist as a scientific concept, actually it still does exist as a social concept. And um, people understand race by a fundamentally kind of skin colour, but actually it doesn't stop there. It just talks about Islamophobia. You don't have to be of any colour to be a person from or that follows the Muslim faith. Um, but actually it's used as a racism, isn't it? It's used as a form of racism to attack Asian people. But actually anyone else they can uh, 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 bring into that and by, you know, well, it's quite easy to do when some uh, people who used to come from, uh, came from Nigeria kill a soldier on the streets, then actually quite a lot of black people start to think, oh my God, they're coming for us again as well. You know, it's, you know, so yeah, racism changes, as in these are capitalism, capitalism change, and they've used Islamophobia very well, up to a point anyway, um, to um, try and divide people. Um, but it's, you know, it's our job, through the class struggle, through the people fighting back, to actually point out that actually there aren't any, well, one or two. Um, Islamic banks in the city of London, aren't they? Yeah, Sharia banks, what have you. Uh, don't charge interest, supposedly. Um, but actually, you know, who's responsible for the banking crisis? It wasn't Muslims, it was, you know, the boys in the, the, um, the public schools of England. Um, and lastly, our culture being subsumed. Well, oh, it's kind of, you know, part of the history of capitalism. Um, so, yeah, popular music owes a lot to uh, an African heritage in terms of the United States of, uh, United States of America. Um, and inside of that, there's a history of that culture being stolen. So, you know, the classic is of, you know, Elvis Presley. But you can go through the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, all based on black music. Um, you can have an argument about that. I'm not a great Beatles fan. Some people are for the Stones, because at least the Stones actually pay tribute to people they stole music off. Uh, and they used to have them in their bands. They still do have them in their And so on. You know, that's how I got a bit more time for the Stones. Um, and they made it a bit more... Obvious, and actually, so it was in the community as well. Quite a lot of black people bought the Beatles records and the Rolling Stones records because they rec and Elvis Presley because they recognised that they were actually playing black music, and they weren't afraid of saying, "But this is from you know." It's, well, some of them might be slightly, but because um, Elvis was from the south and didn't do a lot during the civil rights movement, that has to be said. But he was personally um, not that racist. That's best I can say, it, I guess. Um, um, but anyway, so yeah, so they did subsume black culture, uh, and people got ripped off. So you know. I'm like, quite concerned that you know, Led Zeppelin still ain't paying the rights to the people that they stole the songs off. And I actually like Led Zeppelin, which is not very fashionable, I know. Um, but, you know, so this went on all the time, stealing from, you know, from black culture, fundamentally at music, fundamentally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're against that. We think people should pay their dues, and we think that all those um, blues singers in the, in the Delta, if they're still alive, should be getting the money off all these rock bands that stole their music and made billions and billions out of it. Of course they should. Um, but, you know... Culture is a thing that changes after the revolution, so it's like when we talked about the Labour Party briefly, I didn't quite get it all there, um, and how the movement went into the Labour Party to try and change things that way. Uh, one of the things is, you know, Nelson Mandela House is now the name of a block in wherever it happens to be, Peckham, if you watch um, Only Fools and Horses, but you get the idea. Change the names of things as if that makes those things actually different, um, more socialist perhaps, what have you. Uh, I think someone said, but it's, no, those are the last things that changed. You had the revolution. Everything goes into ferment, everyone challenges everything, everyone starts to have different ideas, new ideas, and they decide to change the names of things because it fits better with um, um, their outlook in life. But Labour Party people kind of did it, did it the other way around. They didn't change anything, but changed some of the names. 
to try to pretend that somehow Nelson Mandela was free because you named the house place after him or something. I don't know. Um, and he even had the spectacle of Botang when he got elected um, in um, in Brent. You know, first Brent, then um, we, we won't be free until Soweto is free. It's all this kind of hyperbole and stuff. Um, but it was just like talk, you know. Um, so yeah, culture is an important thing, but we fight to get people their rights in terms of their cultural rights and you know intellectual property and things like that, I suppose. Um, you know, for individuals, not companies. Um, you know, so if you write a song, you should get your money for it. So all of that, yeah. So we, in that sense, black culture has been ripped off. Um, but fundamentally, it's something that doesn't. We can't really you know, do much about it until after the revolution. Then we, you know, we'll have a you know, there's the different culture that exists now inside society, and that's all great, it's all mixed up, and you know, people take bits from everywhere and so on. Um, but uh, fundamentally, the socialist culture that we're interested in is one where actually we don't have a black culture and a white culture and you know, all that stuff, all those divisions, um, which is hard to talk about on this side of the revolution. But afterwards, you know, we just have, we just have music, um, you know, and you know, you'll have rap orchestra kind of bands as well as other types of music, I don't know. But you know, you'll have different things that we can't quite comprehend at the moment and think are very good. But that comes after we've had the revolt and we've actually taken control and which we are now producing things, including culture, in our own interest and for our own needs uh, as human beings. Um, so yeah, um, to get to that, we need to build a kind of Leninist type party that gets it together so that we can do things together and actually smash the state. Um, those are the big questions. And in that, black and white working people together are the only ones that can do it. Uh, and in doing that, we break down races. And that's the fundamental Marxist argument that we're making today. And I'd urge people to consider joining us and finish considering, just join us, but most importantly, get stuck in the movement because um, there's a hell of a lot to do. Um, and I do think that actually we'll get more and more people around us on the question of fighting racism and fighting fascism together because it's such a key issue for capitalism and it's becoming more and more a key issue for any serious fighter uh, today. Thanks.